In his mind, Cyan reflected on how it had been nearly fifteen years since their last private meeting. Duke Willius Verth, the eminent feudal lord of Velius, a western province of the Ushif Empire, was known by many names, but the world revered him as the guardian of the continent. This title was earned through his heroic efforts to halt the demon invasions, utilizing his exceptional magical prowess and extraordinary intellect. Duke Willius carried this immense burden voluntarily, fighting valiantly until his demise in battle against the demon king's army. His ultimate aspiration was the peace and prosperity of the entire continent. To Cyan, however, the duke's legacy was painted differently. He saw Willius as a man who chose to live selflessly, dedicating his life to the service of others out of his own free will. In Cyan's eyes, this was foolish. The duke had once remarked on Cyan's uncanny ability to follow the trajectory of a sword and evade it with precision, a talent that left Krantz perplexed. The duke recounted a specific instance when Krantz had attacked, describing how Cyan had looked directly at the path of the swinging blade and deftly turned his body to avoid it. The duke inquired about Cyan's training in swordsmanship, noting that Cyan had never shown an interest in it before. Cyan, as always, found the duke's perceptiveness daunting. He confessed that he hadn't formally learned swordsmanship but had practiced secretly every night. The duke, seeking more information, asked why Cyan had hidden such exceptional skills. Cyan, embarrassed, explained that he had wished to avoid attracting attention. Yet, the duke was not satisfied with this answer, pointing out that despite his desire for anonymity, Cyan had exerted himself fully to defeat Krenz. The duke then brought up Cyan's actions afterward, specifically mentioning how he had kicked Krenz while he was down. The question seemed probing, as if the duke was trying to gauge Cyan's true capabilities. Cyan admitted that he had wanted to prove himself, to demonstrate that he was superior to Krenz despite their shared lineage. He asserted that this was the true purpose of the duel. The duke, finding amusement in Cyan's candidness, praised him for his clear and composed response, which showcased his level-headedness and undiscovered talent. The duke expressed his pleasure and foretold that Cyan would one day be a significant and dependable ally for Ashel. This prediction stirred a deep sense of betrayal within Cyan, rooted in his past life. He felt a wave of confusion and disappointment. Why should he be expected to support Ashel? It was always the same, the duke's obsession with Ashel remained unwavering. Anger welled up inside Cyan, his hands clenching into fists. The duke then offered a reward, asking Cyan if there was anything he desired. With a fierce resolve and sharp eyes, Cyan decided he would ruin everything Ashel had strived to achieve. He responded to the duke with his request, determined to see his plans through. Moments later, Emily's face turned ashen upon learning of Cyan's intention to join the battlefront. Cyan attempted to reassure her, stating that nothing was set in stone yet. Emily, however, was incredulous and questioned his sanity, emphasizing the horrific nature of the place he wished to go. She reminded him that the region was infested with monstrous demonic creatures. Valias, the western province of the Ushif Empire, was known as the battlefront, with Lima Valley being the epicenter of this centuries-long conflict with demons. Due to the perilous nature of Lima Valley, Duke Willius Verth, who had always vehemently opposed such an idea, presented Cyan with a challenge, he must prove himself worthy of the battlefront within a month. The criteria for this worthiness remained unclear to Cyan, but he resolved to enhance his physical strength as much as possible in the given time. Though he acknowledged his current inferiority to his peers, he also recognized the advantage of retaining his combat instincts and the modest amount of magic he had detected within himself. He believed that with rigorous training, he could maximize his potential. Determined, Cyan began his training immediately. Suddenly, his door burst open, and a woman stormed in. It was Alice, her blue hair framing a stern expression. She seized him by the collar, shaking him vigorously. Emily, who had just greeted Lady Alice, watched as Alice confronted Cyan about his request to join the battlefront. Cyan's face went pale as he pleaded with Alice to release him. She complied, dropping him to the ground, leaving him feeling utterly drained. Alice remarked that defeating Kren seemed to have inflated Cyan's ego. She then ordered him to follow her to the rooftop. Once on the rooftop, Alice laid out her conditions. She told him that if he could endure her attacks for three minutes, she would consent to him going to the battlefront. Cyan, bewildered, asked if such drastic measures were necessary. Alice, unwavering, demanded that he answer a single question, was he seeking the family title? Cyan was taken aback by her assumption, as he had no interest in such matters. His silence, however, was misinterpreted by Alice as confirmation. She instructed him to draw his sword. Cyan, feeling overwhelmed, realized that his day had been nothing short of chaotic, especially considering his recent duel with Krenz. Nonetheless, he prepared himself as Alice launched her assault. 
Cyan hadn't anticipated it, but he managed to deflect Alice's strike, a feat that stunned her. For a ten-year-old to block an attack of that caliber seemed improbable. Cyan pondered if Alice truly intended to unleash her full strength against her younger brother, who was seven years her junior. Alice took a step back, processing what had just occurred. A rapier's blade was light and quick, yet Cyan had deftly parried her longsword. She questioned whether it was merely luck. She remarked that his intuition was sharper than she had expected. Seeing her expression, Cyan knew he was in trouble. Determined to test him further, Alice launched a barrage of ferocious attacks. She lunged at him with renewed intensity, but Cyan blocked her sword once more with his rapier. Not only that, he skillfully maneuvered his blade to position it parallel to her throat. Alice was momentarily taken aback. Cyan, straining under the effort, shifted his sword, but Alice retaliated, sending him flying. He landed atop a pillar, gasping for breath and contemplating how quickly things could turn dire. If he hadn't twisted his sword just right, he would have seriously injured her. His swordsmanship skill, thick fog, was designed for lethal efficiency. Cyan acknowledged the difficulty of fighting non-lethally given his current strength. He wondered how much time remained. He was compensating for his lack of power by imbuing his sword with mana, but his reserves were nearly depleted. Alice, also breathing heavily, invoked the elements of earth and wind to enhance her weapon. Cyan was astonished to witness her mastery of sixth star magic. Alice's blade glowed with a blue aura, known as the Aqua Blade. With a mixture of desperation and determination, Cyan questioned if Alice intended to kill him. Her relentless muttering about not losing and the intensity in her eyes made it clear she was serious. Perched on the edge, Cyan foresaw disaster even if he managed to block her next attack. He decided to trust his instincts and hoped his plan would succeed. With a burst of speed, he charged at Alice. She was gathering power, her sword pointed skyward. Gripping his rapier tightly, Cyan silently prayed for intervention. As Alice's power surged, Cyan hoped for Yulkin's timely arrival. Just as Alice and Cyan were about to clash, Yulkin appeared, shouting, Stop! He intercepted Alice's blade with his own sword while grabbing Cyan by the back of his neck. The force of Alice's attack resulted in a massive explosion. Yulkin wore a stern expression as he addressed Lady Alice, chastising her for being too harsh on her much younger opponent. Cyan, still suspended from Yulkin's grasp, sighed in relief, having anxiously awaited Yulkin's arrival. As if snapping out of a trance, Alice gasped and immediately embraced her brother, apologizing profusely. She confessed that she must have momentarily lost her mind, tears and snot streaming down her face as she expressed her desperation to prevent him from going to the battlefield. Cyan smiled, thinking how typical it was of Alice to be so intense and passionate. She always put her heart into everything she did. Alice was the epitome of excellence, excelling in all subjects at the Royal Academy, where the most talented children gathered, whether in swordsmanship, magic, or academics. Her beauty was unparalleled, earning her the moniker, God's Child. From a young age, she had trained in swordsmanship and was regarded as a future guardian of the continent, along with their eldest brother, Achelivert. Tragically, she was killed shortly after joining the Knights of Light. Cyan hugged her tightly, thinking of how much he had missed her. His embrace caught Alice's attention, and in his mind, he vowed to protect her this time. Alice then turned her attention to Yulkin, puzzled, and asked he was the Duke's guardian knight. She was confused since the Duke had just left for the war. Yulkin explained that he was following the Duke's orders to protect the young master for a while. Although he was supposed to carry out this duty in secret, Cyan had sensed Yulkin's presence since leaving the Duke's office. Cyan wondered if Yulkin would have remained hidden if he hadn't noticed him. He also questioned why his father had instructed Yulkin to follow him secretly. Suddenly, Cyan felt groggy, and Alice caught him as he fell asleep, smiling and commenting on how he was still a little kid. The next day, Alice returned to the academy, having come back briefly to see their father before her graduation. Cyan, feeling the urgency to grow stronger, focused on strength training for the past two weeks, though ten push-ups were his limit. He felt like he had hit a wall and knew he needed a new approach. Emily knocked on his door to inform him that a package had arrived. Cyan's excitement grew as Emily brought it in, complaining about the foul smell. It was the hellhound's blood he had requested, a rare item from Lima Valley that he had heard was available on the black market. The blood of demonic beasts was notorious for its poisonous smell and the burning sensation it caused upon consumption, but it was also rumored to permanently increase the consumer's mana and strength. Most dismissed this as mere myth, but Cyan knew from past experience that it was true. Emily asked if he was really going to drink it, and he confidently answered yes. In his mind, Emily need not worry, since he had survived her cooking before. 
He chugged down the blood, reminded of the first time he had tasted her mushroom soup, which had caused his heart to stop momentarily. Compared to that, the blood was nothing. He finished the entire drink, remarking on how surprisingly palatable it was. A surge of power coursed through his veins. Turning to Emily, he announced his intention to go for a walk, eager to test the effects. Cyan stepped outside, heading toward a mountain that overlooked the duchy. It had been some time since he last visited this place, a spot he frequented when he wanted solitude. He had been waiting for this moment for the past two weeks, a time when Yolkin was absent for his regular reports. The mountain was a place of peace for him, but today, it held a deeper significance. Ashel had once received a divine revelation from Lumendal, the god of light, about an ancient temple hidden in these mountains. Though skeptical, Ashel had discovered a spot where the flow of mana was concentrated. The revelation had not yet occurred, but Cyan was already aware of its existence. Cyan knelt, placing his hand on the ground. His power radiated through the earth, causing it to crack and reveal an underground passage. He grinned, relishing the thought that Ashel had no clue about his actions. Entering the passage, he noticed changes since his last visit. This was an ancient temple dedicated to Lumendal, erased from history following the Demon Wars 300 years ago. The temple's existence in the mountains behind the castle was a well-kept secret. Ahead of him lay a glowing sword on a pedestal. This was Duran Dark, a holy relic blessed by Lumendal. In 999 BFA, on August 12, humanity had driven the Demon King's army from Valias using ancient relics known as the God's Weaponry. Duran Dark had played a crucial role in their victory, and Cyan's future demise would be linked to this very sword, eventually wielded by a shelvard. Cyan pondered if the sword had any connection to his regression. He reached out to touch Duran Dark, but as he anticipated, nothing happened. Frustrated, he kicked the pedestal, cursing the so-called Holy Sword. His mood soured, he mocked it, Holy Sword, my ass. He turned to leave, intent on completing his business elsewhere. Unbeknownst to him, the sword seemed to react to his disdain. As he walked past a beam of light, he felt an eerie presence. Shadows coalesced into a form, something otherworldly emerging from the depths. Cyan said, found it. At first glance, it appeared to be the shadow of a sword. However, it was far more than just a shadow. Cyan channeled his power into it, revealing a hidden pathway behind the altar of light. As he opened the door, he was greeted by the sight of his sword, glowing red atop a pedestal. Nice to see you again, Cyan murmured to the sword. He grasped the hilt of Kyram, the demonic sword he had wielded before his death. As soon as he touched it, an ominous, powerful aura emanated from the blade. Good morning, Kyram, he said, though the sword did not respond. Cyan wondered if it was still dormant. Despite this, he felt an exhilaration that made him want to test the blade's edge immediately. A shadow with sharp eyes materialized on the ground, asking Cyan if he felt no fear. Kyram's voice echoed, questioning if Cyan understood the implications of awakening it. Cyan shrugged, replying nonchalantly that he didn't care and that perhaps it meant the sword was now his. The shadow grew larger and more menacing, informing him that it was too late for regrets now that he had awakened a demonic sword. The shadow grinned, revealing rows of pointed teeth, and lunged at Cyan, claiming his body would belong to it. But Cyan, unperturbed, casually choked the shadow. You weren't this pathetic before, he remarked. The shadow began to dissipate, revealing a human face. Kyram, astonished, wondered how Cyan could touch it. In response, Cyan reiterated that the sword was his. Kyram's long, pink, pointed nails slashed at Cyan as she screamed. He lost his grip, and Kyram leapt backward. When fully revealed, Kyram was a woman. She demanded to know who he was, noting the dark aura surrounding him. She asked if he was the successor. Why do I sense Eru's aura from you? Kyram demanded, her eyes narrowing with suspicion. Cyan's grin widened, a devilish glint in his eyes. You're right. I am Eru's successor, he declared confidently. Your master is back, Kyram. Now, bow down. Kyram's expression hardened. You're just a child. I refuse to accept this. A battle ensued. Cyan quickly realized that words alone wouldn't convince the demonic sword. He knew that Kyram's ultimate goal was to dominate the body of its wielder. With no other option, he decided to show his strength. Cyan's grin turned feral as he activated demonic sword control. Instantly, Kyram was pulled to the ground with a bone-jarring impact that made her groan. I'll say this once, Cyan warned, his voice cold. Why won't you accept me as your master while I'm still being nice? Kyram gritted her teeth. How can you wield that power, she spat, defiance in her eyes. Cyan activated demonic sword control again, smashing her face into the ground repeatedly. Her head was soon buried deep in the earth. Ready to accept me now? Cyan asked, his tone dripping with mockery. 
I accept, Kyram muttered, though she called him, human. Cyan was about to activate demonic sword control again, but stopped when she hastily corrected herself, master. Satisfied, Cyan felt it was time to return. He had been gone too long. Kyram, now in her sword form, sighed contentedly. It's been so long since I felt fresh air, she said, her voice echoing from the blade. She emerged from the sword, looking like a black balloon with eyes, a mouth, and pink hair. This is refreshing, she exclaimed. Master, what is your name? Cyan, he replied, giving his full name. I've never heard that name before, Kyram commented, still skeptical. Did Eru really choose a kid like you? In my past life, yes, Cyan answered, his expression serious. Kyram looked confused. Past life? I died once before, Cyan explained. Kyram's eyes widened in disbelief. What the hell, she thought, and then she noticed something else. 